delay in, in getting started. So just a little introduction on, on the Hive. So Hive incubates, funds, and launches companies in the big data space. Uh, primarily our focus is on applications. So applications that span both uh, functional areas like security, finance, uh, CRM, data center management, uh, and so on, as well as vertical areas that, that you can see out there. Um, the Hive and our startups are also hiring. So if you are a software engineer, a group developer, and, and if you have focus in telco security, we'd love to hear from you. Um, the hashtag for today's event, be part of the conversation. The hashtag is Hive Data. So go to Twitter. And with that, I'd like to introduce Russell Germany, who is uh, Hive's uh, data scientist in residence. Our speaker tonight is Jay Krebs. Jay is principal staff engineer at LinkedIn, where he is the mastermind of LinkedIn's open source portfolio, including Voldemort, Apache Kafka, and Azkaban. Jay holds a master's of computer science from UC Santa Cruz. I got to know Jay as co-workers at LinkedIn, where he has created a system for log processing that handles over 60 billion events per day. His post, The Log, What Every Software Engineer Should Know About Real-Time Data's Unifying Abstraction, was considered by many the post of the year. Jay is here to present this work. super excited about, uh, I'm going to be talking about, you know, a log as kind of an abstraction for real-time data and how that fits into the architecture of LinkedIn. Uh, and, and I really think this is one of the more interesting things uh, in this uh, space of distributed systems, which is a, a space filled with really interesting things, uh, so that's saying a lot. So hopefully I can infect you with a, a little of my own excitement. Um, okay, so, so the plan is... The, the plan is... What's the plan? What is the plan? Uh, the, okay, so the plan is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a little bit about Kafka. This isn't going to be a system-focused talk, so I'm not going to tell you a talk about how it works. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about our motivations and working on it. Um, and then I'm going to branch out a little bit and talk about um, some of the uses for it and, and some uses more generally for this, this log concept, which is the theme for the talk. So, so Kafka is a messaging system, or at least that's what we usually tell people. Um, so there's you know, producers, and they send data, and there's a Kafka cluster, and there's consumers, and consumers can subscribe to this uh, stream or feed of messages. Um, and uh, it's a little bit different from kind of traditional you know, message queuing uh, message systems. Um, it, was, it was designed by people with kind of a different background and a different perspective on this, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but at a high level, you know, this, this is what the thing is doing. Um, so uh, there's a similar thing out there. Uh, you know, Kafka is an open source thing, but there's also Amazon Kinesis, which is actually very similar. Uh, and so this is a you know AWS web service, and I think these things are actually pretty comparable. Probably uh, Kinesis was a little bit inspired by Kafka, uh, which is good because actually the first thing I worked on at LinkedIn was a distributed key value store which was a copy of uh, Amazon Dynamo. Uh, so now, now the role is in a restaurant. Um, and it also makes it a lot easier to explain because um, uh, for a long time, Kafka was kind of a weird thing, and we were trying to explain why it worked a certain way, and now at least there's two things. So it's like there's a class. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so I'll give a little background on where I came from and the problems we were trying to solve. So the, the story was this, um, you know, I basically shown up at LinkedIn and I was working on a bunch of different things. Uh, one of them was, you know, some real-time applications that needed to process data. And the other was, uh, we were trying to get Hadoop running and get you know, loaded into our Hadoop clusters. And this is this was whatever, like six years ago, it was a, it was a fairly long time ago. Um, and um, so I was thinking a lot about, uh, you know, data integration, how we were going to do ETL and data loads, and then also the real-time processing side of it. Um, and so at the time, I was really interested in trying to unify how we were collecting data and get it, you know, into some kind of central pipeline. Um, and so we, we went through a bunch of experiments, like we got a bunch of uh, ActiveMQ brokers, which we were using for one thing, we thought, well, maybe we could run everything through this, and that just totally didn't work. And so then we tried more and more things, and it never worked. And eventually, we just kind of put the idea on the side. And uh, we came back to it a few years later um, as ETL and data collection became like more of a pain point for us. And we tried to go back and build something that would really work the way we wanted. Um, so that was kind of our motivation. You know, from that experience, we kind of got three you know, basic principles that we were, we were motivated by. One was we wanted to have kind of one pipeline that we could collect everything with, right? So, so what we saw was we had different pipelines for subscribing to like database data, we had ActiveMQ, which was used for like some queuing stuff, we had these like log files that we were scraping and aggregating off servers, and it all worked differently and it all kind of didn't work differently when it didn't work. Um, and so, so the idea was if we could somehow simplify this and have a single system to, to you know, ingest data, that would help a lot. Um, the second thing was, you know, we, we've been paying a lot of attention to uh, stream processing, which is this kind of niche area of, of academic interest, primarily probably, you know, around the uh, 2000, 2005, a little before that. And um, you know, I actually thought it had a lot of promise, even though it didn't do very well uh, as commercial systems at that time. Um, primarily because um, you know, if you think about a message broker or messaging, um, it's a very low level thing. You kind of send it a message, it holds onto the message for you. You can come pick up the message, but it doesn't really provide you more powerful processing capabilities, right? And, and so I think you know, if you're if you're going to attack this space, you should try to take. Um, you, we wanted to, you know make it possible to have higher level processing abstractions that would sit on top, um, which actually puts some demand on the underlying system. And then finally, um, you know, I think one of the things we were uh, really interested in doing was, was you know, make something that was a proper distributed system, something that was you know, managed as a cluster. Uh, so, so probably the, um, you know, the difference, I would say, in most of the types of data infrastructure that's built now is you think about your system as a cluster, right? You think about HDFS as a cluster. You don't think about, oh, I'm connecting to this HDFS server and I'm connecting to this HDFS server. You just largely think about the cluster and how much space is there in the cluster, when it works. When it doesn't work, then maybe you think about the individual servers. Um, and I think that's actually really powerful, right? It's a way that you can have something that you operate centrally that serves potentially an entire company's worth of uh, you know, engineers, data streams, whatever, right? And, and we wanted to make that possible uh, in kind of the messaging uh, space as well. Um, so, so looking at these different use cases, we came up with a bunch of characteristics that you would have to be able to do uh, if you wanted to take over stuff. So for log data, you have to be pretty fast and you have to support a lot of data, right? So you need to have scalability that's not that much worse than the file system, otherwise people are not going to move their log enough of files onto your thing. Um, you also need to have pretty strong guarantees, like a lot of messaging systems actually provide you pretty reasonable guarantees, and for anything that comes out of a database, you're gonna to have to provide strong order, right? So you can't deliver database changes from, say, your, you know, whatever database to your search index out of order, or you'll get the wrong data. Um, and, and as I said, we wanted it to be kind of distributed by default, right? So, so a lot of messaging systems uh, support some kind of, uh, you know, replication mode or clustering mode, but we wanted that to be kind of the default way that you would run it so that you would always have multiple replicas and so on. And so we started working on this, and you know, the first version was pretty simple and we kind of built towards this vision over a period of time. And now um, you know, it's pretty heavily used at LinkedIn. So there's, there's uh, you know, about 175 terabytes of in-flight data. It's low latency, right? The time between when you send a message and when a uh, consumer will get it is just a few milliseconds. Um, and you know, we, we replicate inside the cluster as well as you know, mirroring data between data centers, between clusters. Um, and, and it operates under very high demand. 
Um, and then this actually allowed us to make most of our Hadoop integration fairly automatic. Like this is used for data capture. That data is then mirrored into Hadoop so that if somebody creates a new data stream, it is kind of automatically available in Hadoop. We can create a Hive table for it. The Hive table inherits the schema of you know, the original message stream and so on. Um, and, and this is an open source project with the Apache Software Foundation. Um, pretty healthy usage outside LinkedIn. Uh, a bunch of cool companies use it. Um, and, and a nice ecosystem of supporting stuff, plugins, you know, cluster managers. So that's, that's kind of a, a very fast, high-level overview of Kafka. If you're interested, there's a bunch more you can read on the website about how it works and all that. I'm not going to go into that in great detail. Instead, I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes Kafka different from traditional messaging. Um, I'm going to talk about logs. Right? So, so Kafka is about logs. The abstraction that Kafka provides you know, is, a, is a log. Um, and you know, of course, when I say this, um, that usually confuses people more than it helps. Uh, so I should say what I mean by log. Right? So most people, most people think of logs as being something like this Apache log, where you know there's a bunch of lines in a text file, and you know the the, the lines are kind of delimited by new lines or something. But uh, it's only at best semi-structured, and you're kind of keeping it locally on some machine. Uh, and so this is this is kind of a log, right? Um, you know, it's keeping records of a sort which are written over time. Uh, but, but what I really mean by a log is a little bit more abstract. Okay. So, so now writes are happening from left to right. Uh, so this is the first thing that was written, and this is the, the thing that's about to be written. Uh, what's inside the record, I kind of don't care. It's like your data. Maybe it's your Apache log line. Hopefully it's something a little more structured. Maybe it's a Avro record or a JSON or something. Um, and each log entry has, uh, you know, has a number, and this gets called a lot of things. In Kafka, it's called an offset. Sometimes you hear it called like a log change number or whatever. Um, and this abstraction is really, really common in distributed systems. It shows up all over the place, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so the only thing that we add to this in Kafka is basically partitioning or sharding, so that you can have a topic which is made up of, of lots of individual log, uh, logs, and that lets you scale uh, more easily. So that's, that's the abstraction that Kafka provides. Uh, so, so how is that actually a messaging system? Uh, well, a log is a, a type of messaging if, um, if it supports reads. So, so here's how a log works as a messaging system. You have some data source, um, you know, which is appending writes, uh, you know, appending new messages to the log. And then you have some subscribers. And these two subscribers are reading off the log. Now, the nice thing about this is there's only one log, no matter how many subscribers there are. Uh, each subscriber has some position that it's up to. So this guy is up to record seven. This guy is up to record 11, meaning it's fully common. Uh, so so you know, readers in this model are actually very cheap. They're just kind of scanning this linear log. Um, and um, there's, there's, there's very little cost to having additional readers. So when we're using Kafka kind of in our setup, there are, some, there are some topics which have nobody reading it. There are some topics which have many, many, many people subscribing. It's actually one of the cheaper things. Um, OK, so this is kind of how a log can be used for PubSub. Uh, one of the interesting things about this is you know, the, the, the log naturally comes with this log change number, which you can kind of think of as a notion of time. right? So and you'll actually, in distributed systems, you'll, you'll see them uh, misuse the word time or log change number all over the place, right? And the reason that that happens is that this number actually is a sort of time, right? So, so this guy is caught up to time 7, and this guy is caught up to time 11, right? That's what they read up to. And, um, you know, having this discrete notion of time is actually much nicer in some ways than, you know, checking the clock on the computer, which is maybe different on every computer, and is not very discrete. Okay. So, so now, how does this actually get used in systems? I'm going to give a little bit of information about how logs are used in systems, and then I'll tell you a little bit about why you may care about this. Okay. So, um, so kind of this, the, the, the background that we were coming from was this familiarity with logs and distributed systems. You know, the, the kind of classical uh, log maintenance algorithm is Paxos. So uh, I think Leslie Lamport just won a Turing Award in part for that. 
Um, but there's there's lots of other algorithms. The thing that everybody has heard of is MySQL bin log replication. So everybody knows like MySQL replicates between nodes, and it, it does it in a way kind of similar to what I described, right? There's slaves which are reading out of the, the log of the master. Um, and you know, this pattern is kind of really common in uh, distributed systems from like HBase to Spanner, and I think even in the newer version of HDFS, the, the name node internally has some journal or log that is, uh, you know, maintaining changes. So I'm going to give I'm going to give kind of a very simplistic example of how you can use a log uh, to get two things. Uh, the first thing that you get out of the log in these systems is uh, replication. It gets your data copied around. The second you get is consistency. It gets the changes in the right order to the right place. All right, so I'm going I'm to use this really useful example of maintaining a, a hash table of CEOs, um, which is not a very practical example. And now, now I'll talk about how this is uh, applicable to, to real life systems. Okay, so so this is my example. I basically have a hash table, and I want to I want to maintain it in a fault tolerant way on two machines. Right, so if I have a hash table on one machine, it's super easy. You just do your writes. So either the machine is up or down. It's always consistent with itself. Um, but if you have two machines, it suddenly becomes much more complicated, right? One machine could be down, it could miss some of the updates. If you're sending updates over the network, you might miss one. Uh, if you miss an update, then who knows? You know, maybe you don't know that Marissa Meyer is the CEO of Yahoo, right? So in this example, I have basically a list of writes. And then this is the final state I would hope to have on both of my replicas, right? And I want to be able to maintain that even if these two replicas fail. And so this is kind of like a very classic distributed systems problem, and the kind of classic off-the-shelf approach is to use a log. So you basically take all the puts, all the writes, you throw them into a log, and the log feeds the two replicas. And now you can reason very precisely about where the replicas are. If they come back up, um, they will know what, what time or what offset they're at, and they can read from that point on. So maybe they come up with no data, and they just reload everything, or maybe they come up with some data that they've kind of logged out to this, or say it in some state, and then they read forward to that. So, so this is kind of a classic solution to this. If you abstract this back a little bit, you get kind of the two classical patterns in distributed systems, right? One is state machine replication, which is essentially the hash table thing I described, where you have peers, your writes are going to some log, and all of these peers are fed off this log. And the other would be kind of a primary backup you know, this is more like the MySQL style, where you have a master, the master maintains a log, and the slaves feed off the log, okay? So why would we care about this? This is very much kind of the internal details of a distributed system, right? What's the use of this in practical life? Well, it may be useful if you're like building a distributed system, uh, but like hopefully, like that's not everybody's day job, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about some really practical applications of this. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is data integration. So this is this is the first problem that I was just talking about. Um, this is the how do I get all the data that we have into my new cluster problem? Okay. Um, and uh, the reason that this I think is such a pressing problem right now is two things. Right. The first is I guess what people are considering data has expanded a lot. Right. Um, if you were to ask your company 10 years ago, you know, what, what data do you have, they would probably tell you about their, their database tables. Right? They would say, well, we have a user's table, we have a product table, we have an order's table. Um, but I think that that's actually expanded quite a lot, right? So, so like for a consumer, you know, website like LinkedIn, we have a bunch of, you know, business events like clicks, impressions, page views, searches, whatever. Um, and then we have a bunch of application metrics, which are kind of essential to running a bunch of machines, right? This is CPU load and requests per second and, you know, a few million uh, user-defined counters that our programmers have put in all their code. Uh, and finally, you have log data, which is like, you know, who called what and how many errors did you get? Um, and so, and I think companies now would consider all of these their data, right? But the characteristics of these, of these later categories are that they're, they're really high volume. Right, so, so the first problem in data integration is that like what we consider data has changed a lot and it doesn't all look like database data. The second problem is that the systems that we, uh, that we have have expanded. Right? There's been this kind of explosion of really cool distributed systems. Uh, and this, these are the kind of things we run. Uh, different companies would have a different list. 
But we've got basically a key value store, and we have a graph store which does graph queries to tell you the distance between LinkedIn users or whether or not you're allowed to view this person's profile. Uh, we have a, an OLAP store which would show, you know, like an advertiser what their click-through rate was and their different ad campaigns or people who viewed your profile. Um, we have a search system which is in many ways the, back, the backbone of our business. Um, and then we have like a monitoring system. Uh, and then we have offline, we have the main interrogator. So all of these systems have to get fed with data. And in some sense, the value of one of these systems is only there when you get the data into it, right? Uh, the Hadoop cluster on its own was not super valuable. You have to get stuff into it, and then you can start processing it. So I actually started working on this problem in a very ad hoc way. Uh, so, so I guess we had got the Hadoop cluster, and I started working on kind of copying data in, and I started working on you know, copying data out so that we could serve results. And so in a sense, I was building one or two of these pipelines. And then it turns out that each of these pipelines is actually pretty hard. You have to handle all the failures. You have to make sure that the data here matches the data here. Um, so you have consistency problems, right? How do you, if you, if you end up counting things across different systems, it turns out you get different counts in each system. It's, it's a total disaster. Um, and so these are exactly the same problems that you have in a distributed system, right? You have nodes. You have to keep them all in sync. And so, so my view of this is you can kind of think of like your big company and, and all of its like crazy systems that it's got as one big distributed system. And you kind of think of the problem of like replicating data within that um, as similar, right? And, and then you know, a lot of the things that are uh, available to you, a lot of the tricks in the distributed systems literature are applicable to this kind of large company-wide data integration. Uh, and, and so anyhow, the, the, the takeaway was we're never going to get to full connectivity building out each pipeline. It, it took too long. And, and so then we started working on Kafka to try and consolidate a lot of the input. Uh, you can use it for an output of data. You can feed things back to each other. And this was really kind of our approach to data integration. And you can see that the, the characteristics of these things are pretty different, right? That the new cluster maybe loads data every you know, 15 minutes or so, so it's a little bit slower. Some of these other systems are very fast. They may be you know, up to the second. And just a practical example of this working um, you know, for something like LinkedIn. So we, we uh, have jobs on our site. So we have a jobs front end that shows people jobs. And you can, this is actually a pretty simplified view, but the, the, the reality is more complicated. But when somebody views a job, what needs to happen? Uh, so, so obviously we're going to track the, a job view occurred. Uh, it gets published to some Kafka cluster, which has a topic of all the job views. And then there's a bunch of subscribers to that box, right? So one is Hadoop, right? So Hadoop actually subscribes to everything, because the goal is to have a complete record of everything that's happened. That's, that's, that's kind of the data warehouse view. Uh, but security also does, right? So, um, I don't actually know if they look at job views, but they look at a lot of these things for like scraping, spam, you know, abuse, anything you have on the internet, people are going to try and mess with you in some way. Okay, now we also need to show people who uh, posted the job whether or not, you know, they're getting good conversion. What's, their, what's the number of people looking at their job? What's the number of people applying? That kind of stuff, that's kind of their ROI. And they have some work for it. Uh, then we have a system that recommends jobs. It needs to know actually which jobs are popular. What jobs are people looking at? When we recommended this job, did the person actually click on it? Um, and finally, we have a monitoring system because if uh, nobody's looking at jobs, then something's probably broken, right? And so this is kind of a very simple example for one thing. Now we have about you know, 300 other types of uh, core events that flow out that have something like this. And a lot of the, a lot of the um, fan outs actually much more complicated, but that kind of gives you an example of how you can get like, data integration to be a core problem. Okay, so, so that was data integration. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about stream processing. Um, and this is, you know, this is uh, something that I think a lot of people consider uh, almost uh, niche, right? Like, like it's a new thing, you know, do we really need it? I actually think it's, uh, it's really important. I think uh, the first thing that you want once you have real-time data feeds is you want to process them in real time. Not always. It doesn't, like, supplant uh, batch processing and it doesn't supplant you know, real-time services, but, it, but it's a pretty important ingredient. Um, so if I were to look at something like LinkedIn, I would say probably about 
25% of the stuff is just purely offline, like it's just like some batch process and needs to run like every day or like once a week or something. Um, and probably about 50% is real time, meaning it needs to happen in the context of request right there. Like you load a page, the page comes back to you. Um, but the remaining 25% is asynchronous, and that's really understood. So, so I think this is really important. Um, the analogy I use when talking about it is that like, um, if you think about the US census, um, this, is, this is kind of a batch process. I don't know if people know how it works, but like every 10 years, um, you know, they kind of go out and they query the whole country by walking around and writing down everybody who lives there. And whenever you talk to somebody um, who's a software engineer about this, they're like, this is the craziest thing. Why don't they just journal all the births and deaths? And then we can tell you how many people there were in the country at any point in time through all of history, right? And that's, that's essentially the difference between you know, a batch process and a stream process. Um, but if you think about it, why does the census work this way? It works this way because when it started in like 1790, all they had was horses. There was no real-time journal of births and deaths. They had to like ride around and go collect this manually. And this is exactly true, right? So when we were collecting like hourly batches of log files, there was really no interest in stream processing them, right? You, know, you are, only have like an hour of data. Once you have a real-time feed, it's actually very interesting to process that real time. The second issue is, even though a lot of what uh, is presented as, as stream processing is actually a pretty weak programming model, it doesn't need to be. There's no reason that stream processing should be such a weak model. It could actually be very powerful, right? So, so I think it can actually be seen as a generalization of batch processing. So if you think of a you know a live service or a web server or something as doing you know request response processing when you send a request and send you a response right and you think of you know a data warehouse or a new process that maybe scans your full data set and gives you all the results at once um, in the middle between those two is something which is able to control its window of processing and that's essentially the definition of a stream processor right it takes in some input and it decides when it's going to start producing output. And if you have that control, then you can be kind of as low latency as you want or as slow as you want. Right? So, so I think those are the kind of the realizations that I think make us think this is really important and an area we want to be good at. So, so for a consumer website, the kind of examples of where you would use this are things like monitoring, security, uh, you know, any kind of content processing pipeline. Like before stuff gets into a search index, there's usually you know, a team of 20 people who are working on normalization and relevance and extracting features and whatever, right? Um, so, you know, that kind of work. The, the same, like, we have news articles on LinkedIn now, that whole import process. Um, do you know any kind of, like, news feed? Uh, like, it depends on how you create your news feed. Some are done kind of at quarry time, and some are done ahead of time. Um, Twitter does it ahead of time. I actually think something like Twitter, you could imagine that whole thing being like largely a stream processing system uh, for a sufficiently sophisticated stream processing system. So, so my view of, of you know, how this works in the system sense is actually really straightforward. Um, you know, I basically see stream processing as you know, logs, which is what we're talking about, uh, in jobs. Jobs are just your code. And you know, so the, the logs are essentially the streaming input. And the jobs transform it into other into other streaming outputs, right? That's kind of my view of this. You don't necessarily need a framework to do this. Um, you can just write code that, that takes input and, and produces output. Uh, but but a framework can actually be pretty helpful, right? If you have a framework, it can handle a lot of the like elasticity and scalability and stuff. So there's stuff out there. Um, you know, these are the ones that work well with Kafka, but there's actually a couple of other things, right? So there's Storm and there's Samsa. Samsa's the one I've been working on. Storm, I think, is from Twitter. Uh, they're both pretty good. Um, but essentially what these are going to do is they're kind of the, uh, the map reduce or whatever if, if Kafka is the HDFS analogy in the real-time domain, right? So these are going to provide you some kind of elastic computing framework on top of it. So you write your code and you can kind of run it across the So the, I'll, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, Samsung's architecture. It's, it's relatively straightforward, right? Um, you know, it sits on top of Kafka. Technically, it's pluggable, so you can plug in other things, like you can have like an HDFS stream implementation, but but it's going to handle you know record at a time type process, uh, and it works with Yarn. Um, so I don't know if people know what Yarn is, but you know, it's like the MapReduce V2. It's the generic cluster management thing. Uh, 
Um, and SAMHSA is just a layer that sits on top of Yarn. Um, and you, you, know, you, you implement some simple API that, that processes messages and produces output, and it will take this and kind of run it on the cluster. And so this is this is a way that we do some monitoring, you know, processing of monitoring data that comes in where you want to compute things and say like, okay, you know, what's my site speed right now, broken down by these different dimensions, or we do analysis of our uh, service call graph, like when a, when a page comes in and it issues calls to different services, we essentially reconstruct that and do analysis of that stream in real time. Uh, so any of these like monitoring data flows where you want results very quickly. Uh, we also do it for content processing. So I talked about that, you know, normalization or standardization that would happen prior to search, indexing, or conditions. Um, and so, so kind of a, a very simplistic example of how these things work. Um, you know, let's say you want to recommend top articles for a company. Maybe you have a news uh, thing which is serving news, and it's reporting uh, which news articles are clicked, right? And maybe you have uh, a database of user information, and maybe that is actually creating a log or, or feed uh, uh, changes to user information. Um, so, so in in a stream processing system like SAMHSA, you can essentially in, index this feed, you know, subscribe to and index this feed, and join on information about the news clicks, kind of enrich it with these user attributes, and then you can aggregate this and create some kind of top top top. Right, so this is kind of like a very simplistic user. Um, and so the, the reason that I think this is so important is um, it actually kind of completes the picture, right? So if this is back to the data integration picture and you have some kind of log which is collecting and, and integrating all these systems, this actually allows you to create new stuff, right? So instead of just pulling in you know, event data or database data as it originated, you can pull that in and actually transform it, right? And because we've spent all this time on data integration, now you can actually get that back in server, right? The point, the point of the processing here is actually to get it into search, or to get it into the key value storage system, or to get it into the graph index, or to get it into the monitoring system, right? And so I think that the, the data integration story actually plays very nicely with the stream processing story, right? Um, and you get the same thing out of Hadoop, right? Hadoop publishes back data, which you can go to things like this. Okay, so that's my talk. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of links here if you're interested. Kafka, Samsa, I wrote up a long blog on this, uh, which goes into much more detail about everything. Um, it is super long. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions if you want. Consumers which are either like you, but are just innately kind of batch oriented, or, or consumers which are going to go down, right? And you have a very high volume event stream, then you kind of keel over in a few minutes, right? It's no good. Um, and so that was one of the things we were trying to accomplish. The nice thing about a log is, I mean, it's basically just a bunch of files, right? It doesn't get any slower as you make it larger. Uh, and that's an important property if you're going to ever have a large backlog of but, but these systems may have improved, and it's going to knock on them, like, they may be much better now. But that was just at that point. So I think the, the arithmetic we did was, if, if we were going to run the system on ActiveMQ at that time, I think we would have had three times the number of total servers that we had in production to support that load, which obviously not. Uh, thanks for the talk. I had a question about the log as an abstraction versus yeah. a signal system. Yeah. So my understanding is you have Kafka and Data Plus. Yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah. Do you, do you see them possibly being consolidated, or do they have to be different systems? Yeah, that's possible. So, so for people who know a ton about the internals of LinkedIn, um, we, we one of the first none of this stuff is like original to me. One of the first pieces of infrastructure LinkedIn has was like a cache for the database, which provides the database changes as a log. 
And that was actually in large part the inspiration for this. We just thought that was hey, that's a really good uh, that's a really good abstraction. Um, and we were using that for the social graph and these other things. And really one of the motivations was to be able to extend that abstraction to um, event data, to locks. So, so yeah, um, so when they started, Kafka had pretty weak uh, fault tolerance guarantees, which are obviously won't fly in that domain. It has pretty good fault tolerance guarantees now. Um, so it would be possible for us to somehow consolidate that. Uh, uh, yeah, this is Xiang from Yahoo. And in fact, we are curious about the new logistics about the Senza uh -huh. with the car car because people start using the stone with the car car. Uh -huh. And we really have something like the car car spawn working uh -huh. on the 0.7 of the car car. Uh -huh. And looks like people start to be tested out for the 0.8 right now. Uh -huh. So my question is uh, what's the really difference <coughs> between the stone? Samsa for now, such that we need to start a new one. Yeah. Rather than make the current one working in the sure. version of the Sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, so the question is what's the difference between uh, Samsa and Storm? That's a good question. So we, we wrote something on the Samsa side that's more detailed. Um, you know, I think we have a slightly different take on the core problems in stream processing. Um, and it's probably a more nuanced answer, but at a high level, you know, essentially the only thing we're modeling between jobs is a log, which means the total state of all your processors is basically their offset and log position. Um, and that makes a lot of things possible in terms of your fault tolerance guarantee, in terms of managing local state, uh, which are just different. Um, that's a very systems internal answer. So if you want the kind of complete breakdown, I would say go, go to that Samsung website and it gives a, some comparison, which is obviously biased because we wrote it and we're working on one of the systems. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think the, the system model is a little different, right? So if I were to try and paraphrase the difference, essentially Storm outputs data and will replay data potentially uh, out of order when a message is not delivered. Um, what we do is we essentially process as a, a linear log, meaning you have a, a single position, and that position you know, advances only when data is processed. Um, that changes a lot about how the system works, it changes a lot about throughput. So I think, it, I think it's, right, so I think our, our way is better. Um, but I think this, this space is very nascent, in my opinion. You know, I said, hey, look, I think a stream processing system can potentially be you know, as good or as powerful as a lot of these batch processing systems, but today they are not, right? I mean, the tools aren't there. There's there's very weak higher level language support, you know, blah blah blah. So I think it's pretty early on. Um, but yeah, I, I guess the more complete answer to your question would be read that page. We kind of read up some of the differences. Any other questions? So you just talked a little about uh, screen processing and the jobs, and I was wondering. If uh, what local state, you, you mentioned local state, Yeah. Uh, how much can you keep, or are you, are you, yeah. are you limited by, that sort of thing? Yeah, so the, uh, you know, I guess one of the core challenges for stream processing, you know, if you, you can call anything a stream processor, I guess even a service which just gets a request and like outputs a response, I mean, I guess it's stream processing in some sense, right? One of the core challenges is, is managing uh, stateful processors. So the, the types of things that you would care about that for is really two things, like, if you know SQL, group by <laughs> and join. Uh, so if you want to index something and be able to join on attributes of that, or you want to be able to keep counts over some window, um, that's kind of state, which in some sense has to be restored if you fail. Um, okay, so the question was, how much state is really practical? Um, the answer is, how long are you willing to wait for your job to restart? Uh, because you have to reload the state. So, so you know, with these fast key value engines, you know, maybe up to five, 10 gigabytes per container is reasonable. Um, and of course, you can have many, you can have as many of those as you want. But if you have 10 gigabytes, you've got to wait for 10 gigabytes of data to, to be written out to your level DB thing, right? So, so the, the real answer is about how long your restart time can pass. Uh, yeah, so, so the next question is, how do you get fault tolerance for local state? Uh, and the answer is you put it in another log. <laughs> I almost included that, but it's kind of an, an implementation detail in SAMHSA. So if you're interested in that, you can Google for SAMHSA stateful processing, and there's a whole write-up on how it works. 
Um, right now, yeah, it's practical up to like 5, 10 gigabytes. Beyond that level, DB kind of sucks, so maybe we need to update to one of these forks, like uh, what's it called? Um, uh, paper level DB, or there's another one from Facebook, which escapes me, but there's a meetup tomorrow. Which, yeah. Any other questions? How should we have? Question in the back. Didn't fully understand what you talked about on Sam's end. Cat, I read your blog, the last blog you had. But the question I, you know, just as a regular law analysis that I look at, I come to, I have come to realize that there's just too many things to look at. That the way system generates logs, logs is quite outdated. Do you think that? Yeah, so, okay, so, so I guess we've made a lot of points. Um, I, I think that the way people think about logs is totally outdated. So people think about log files and parsing logs. I mean, like, why are you parsing your file? Like, why didn't you generate data in some format that required some complicated parsing to begin with? Like, basically, your log file is your communication between you and yourself. It should be totally structured, maintain all the metadata about that. I think if you actually have that, then you can start to build higher level tools that catalog what's there. So the, the if we another really interesting talk that I totally stayed away from is how we manage data at LinkedIn. Um, so so you know one of the things we realized we had to do was it's not enough for everyone just to like log everything however they want. Um, it leads to total chaos. It leads to the same data being generated like 15 different ways. It leads to, you know, this field has almost the same name as this field, but means slightly different things are incomparable. And so we got much more structured about schemas and how do we track different types of things and how do we log them. That kind of structure actually makes a lot of analysis much, much simpler. I don't think we've like solved that problem. It's kind of a deep human problem about agreeing on meaning. Um, but I think like just introducing the level of tooling that's been present in like databases forever, so that you know there's a schema, the schema has fields, the fields have like documentation strings attached to them that say what they mean. Um, if you break compatibility, you know. I mean, these kind of things are just like really basic and are like way radical for people who are thinking about like parsing log files full of like randomly generated JSON strings and change in the whim of anyone, right? So, so yeah, I kind of agree. I think that there's a lot that can be done to kind of like make event data a core part of you know people's data pipelines and data processing. Um, whereas right now it's kind of like a hack that people have you know grafted on to the back of their their data systems. Any other questions? So when you're talking about keeping the formats consistent, this. Kafka have its own serialization to do that, or do you use other stuff to feed it through? Yeah, you know, Kafka is totally agnostic to serialization, um, so the records are just bytes. Um, our data model is basically a key and a value. Um, the, everything we do at LinkedIn is just how LinkedIn does it, so we basically use Abra, we have some schema that's associated with each topic, we allow anyone to kind of advance that schema in a compatible way, but we reject any non-compatible changes. That schema is used as part of the integration with the new and so on. Um, that stuff's super valuable, but, but it's not, um, first of all, it's kind of more like our policy. Uh, I don't know that everybody would want <laughs> the way we do it. Um, it's also kind of a big company problem in a way. Like if you have like four people, you don't really need like schemas. You can just all agree and do it the same way. If you have like, you know, a thousand people, you might need a little bit of structure, right? Um, so, so yeah, that part isn't really open source. I, I tried to open source the schema registry that we use, but, but I think it's never, it's been sitting on some ticket as part of the Agro project being discussed for like a year. I don't, I don't know if we'll ever make it in. Any other questions? Could you talk about uh, the strong versus SAMSA? Uh, I don't know when SAMSA was started, but yeah. Why it was like what were the shortcomings of strong that that you do? Sense? Sure. Um, yeah. So I mean, uh, there's basically you know, I, I, as I said, I think I would probably just read that article, but I, I can give you some basic things. So so it was started uh, before Storm was released, but we kind of continued with it. The things that we were interested in doing was having full integration with Yarn. 
um, you know, having full and proper integration with Kafka, so treating the streams as an order, um, supporting stateful processing, and you know, I would say a different model of fault tolerance, semantics, or guarantees. Um, whether or not, you know, that, that's kind of the distributed systems uh, answer, right, of why the system is better. The things I think this can enable that are, you know, probably better are things like reprocessing. Um, so one of the core things you have to do in a stream processing system is like you write some code, it derives some output. It is a near certainty that you will at some point change how your code works and you can reprocess your input. Um, being able to really do that effectively um, can actually be super challenging. Uh, so for example, if you maintain state in an external system, you know, you can't just like set your job back to the beginning of time and, and keep messing with that system. Um, I, I think that problem is actually pretty poorly solved today. Uh, I don't know if people have heard of like, like the Lambda architecture. You know, I mean, that's, that's a way to do reprocessing where you basically implement everything in the stream processing system and you implement it in Hadoop. Well, that's like a lot of implementing. <laughs> and then you have to operate both these things. I think you know, the stream processing system should just be able to reprocess. Um, so, so anyhow, I think we have some ideas. You can, you can read that page. I think it gives probably a more thorough Any other questions? Uh, about Kafka, Samsung, and yeah. geographic distributed data center. Yeah, yeah. And what's the scope of Kafka to solve that problem? Would it be in Kafka scope or in Samsung scope? Yeah. yeah, so I mean, I guess we kind of solve it in the sense that we basically, um, you know, our architecture is a Kafka cluster, you know, everybody writes to a local Kafka cluster in the data center. We mirror these into aggregate streams that have kind of the full feed from every data center. Um, but, but we don't, inside the Kafka, we don't model data centers, if that makes sense. So it's basically, we just have this mirroring process which aggregates the feeds. This works pretty well for stream data, which kind of naturally aggregates easily. Uh, it's a little harder for like a database or something, which is, you know, taking conflicting rights. So is your question, how do you do stream processing on that environment, or? The kind of answers that uh, data are coming in to a single processing location. However, what about the student game data? Yes, yes. Yeah. You're, you're saying, okay, so one question is how do you get it all together, and the other question is how do you get it back? I mean, the answer is the same in both places. So we, we uh, you know, we, we have mirroring that runs in reverse. We use that for um, output that, you know, like maybe you have a stream processor that drives some output, or also the new cluster often deploys a feed of data through Kafka that ends up going out to all the live data centers where it would be, you know, indexed in some serving database, right? Um, and so those two, you know, it, it's not complicated, this we just mirror between clusters. Um, if you're interested in, um, in the Kafka documentation, there's a section on data centers and kind of how we do it or recommend it. Cool. Um, my understanding is that uh, in point nine release uh, yeah. of Kafka, the offset management is going to the server side. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wanting to maybe expand on this for that, sure. and then also the implications for uh, a new product, but maybe implementing Kafka for the first time. What's your sense of whether a point nine release in the upcoming weeks slash month uh, would that be? Is it uh, suitably stable for a new project, or would you yeah. that stable? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Because sure. Okay, so, so the question is, um, you know, if you're implementing something now, what version should you use, and what's going on with the point nine release? So currently, we just released uh, zero point eight point one, um, and that basically has a really cool feature called log compaction, which is probably more detailed than what we're talking about right now, and a bunch of other <coughs> stuff. Um, it is, I would say, pretty stable. I would actually let us get, we're running in production. I, I would actually wait until we get the next point release off of that, which is probably like two weeks. Because um, we know of at least a couple bugs. Um, they're not like blockers, it's still running in production. <laughs> but we wait until we get those things. Um, the next big release is going to do two things. Um, we're probably going to get a release out pretty soon, which handles offset storage. Um, and what is offset storage? Offset storage is the position of your consumers in the log. And so it turns out that you end up writing that very frequently. The way we were previously doing that was with Zookeeper. Of course, the clients can manage their own offsets if they choose, but most people want something that you provide. Zookeeper is obviously the worst possible way of handling a high write load, whatever. And we knew that at the time, but we just did it anyway. And now 
Uh, we have thousands of these things. They all hammer Zookeeper. We said no problem we put Zookeeper on SSDs, but now even that's because, I mean, so we've got to scale it. Uh, and so this basically uh, you know, creates a log backed uh, offset management thing on the server. The, it doesn't change what offsets mean. They're still totally controlled by the consumer. It's just a much more scalable way of storing. Um, so that's the, the motivation there is to just basically don't kill a zookeeper. Um, the, that will probably come, uh, that will come in the next major release. Directly after that, we're basically redoing the producer and consumer to be richer and more powerful and faster. The producer is actually done now if people are interested in use it. The consumer, we're just starting. If you're, you know, there's a bunch of deficiencies in the clients today. If you're interested in that, there's an ongoing discussion. You, you, so, so if you're trying to get started now, I would wait till the next point release, which will be, you know, 0 0.8, 0.1.1. <laughs> uh, and the new stuff will come soon enough, but, but I wouldn't want it. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, right here. Um, it's great to have very Just to get an idea, how big of an effort is it to come up so from version 0 to version 0 0.81, yeah. um, how long, how many people, is, is this a big oh, yeah. effort to, yeah. I mean, how, how do you guys yeah. work on How much work building it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, work so, so yeah, it's not a huge team. I think there's uh, six people that work on it now. Uh, but LinkedIn is a big company, so any infrastructure thing we have has to support like a thousand engineers. So a certain amount of our time is just like, helping everybody and making sure all the clusters are up. The actual software development effort was originally me, and then me plus June, who was another guy who had just written some Paxos-based data store, and was really into logs, and then Neha. And so, so really, I think, you know, at any given time, there's never been more than like four or five people actually working on So, so yeah, it's not, I, depending on, depending on, um, your perspective, that's either a very large number or not a very large number. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these things, it's not like it's a ton of lines of code, it's actually just getting the lines of code working <laughs> and fully battle tested, which just require, you know, a lot of, a lot of, you just have to be willing to go through the pain. But it's not like, you know, it's not like conceptually we're doing that much that's that complicated. Um, it's just a matter of operationalizing it. Right. We'll take one last question. <laughs> Go ahead. So speaking of common abstraction, you were saying like the stream processing is sort of the same abstraction as the action, just on a small window. So what do you think about the idea of actually having a API that you can code to also like Twitter something for Yeah. Yeah. So just repeat the question. Sure. So the, the question is, um, what about having an API which abstracts over um, streaming versus batch systems? Um, so I think like it's possible. I'm like always skeptical of anything which is trying to abstract over many systems because I think like the operational reality of the system comes into play in a big way. And so in practice, what often ends up happening is you end up needing to thoroughly understand the layer of indirection, plus thoroughly understanding the, the, the system underneath. And my feeling is, you know, at least today, most of these distributed things are pretty real, and you're gonna have to understand what's happening. Um, the, next, the next point, though, is, you know, is that possible kind of at the language level? I think absolutely, absolutely. I think it's totally possible to um, you know, be able to express programs for one or the other. Whether or not you should, I think it's totally possible. The next question is, you know, um, should I be writing something so I can run it in both? I'm not so sure. I mean, my take on it is this, right? If you had a working stream processing system, then things which had to run with low latency would just write there, and you would run it there. The fact that you also need to run the same code in your batch system, to me that's like a bug, that's like a deficiency in the infrastructure, right? Um, I would say the same thing about the batch system, like if you can get away with the higher lids and just run it there. I think having to abstract over both systems and you're gonna end up with kind of like the intersection of features and capabilities with the operational nightmare of both. So I think our uh, aspiration should be that you don't need to do that it may very well be the very best thing possible today. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Great. Thank you, Jay. Please join me and uh, thank you.
Hey, how are you? We should catch uh, up. We should catch up. Oh, so we should catch up. Yeah, yeah, we should. Uh, so, uh, clearly the space is, uh, is kind of short. Yeah, yeah.